welcome you all uh, to this majestic room uh, here at the Ford Foundation on this glorious day. <coughs> I want to first thank our close friend and colleague, Rak Rakesh Rajani from the Ford Foundation, for making this possible for all of us. I also want to thank, and I will do it again, but there's a tremendous team, as you know, that uh, is at the Global Partnership. Um, and while we would often wait till the end to thank them, I'd like to thank them because really I couldn't be here, we couldn't be here today. Janice Lowden, Dijago Wall, Ralph Rose Kranz, uh, Alonso Ortiz Galan, if you could all just stand up, the team that's been so amazing at putting all of this together. I want to welcome you all, champions and anchor partners of the Global Partnership. It was just a year ago, in fact, that we announced the formation of the partnership at the Financing for Development Conference, exactly a year ago, in fact. Uh, within a very short order, we had 30 champion organizations, many of who are represented here. Uh, we launched at uh, UNGA last year, about 10 months ago, um, at the wonderful Waldorf Astoria, where many of you were. Um, the partnership moved from um, you know, sort of a dream into action very quickly. Uh, and the champions and anchor partners and many others engaged in the partnership have uh, rolled up their sleeves, as you know I often say, and gotten to work and gotten things done. Um, the program of the partnership has come together. We now have 150, let me say that again, 150 members from across governments, international organizations. <laughs> It is the only uh, cross-goal, cross-sector, global, multi-stakeholder partnership that was launched at UNGA last year around the SDGs. Uh, and with our 150 members and growing, all of you and many others, uh, the partnership has really shown that it is not just talk, but action that matters. Uh, and we have moved forward. Today, we're really going to be focusing on that. And as many of you know, our framework has really been around commitments, collaborations, and core priorities. In terms of commitments, each of you, all those champions, have made these very powerful and bold commitments to harness the data revolution for sustainable development. And we are proud to say that uh, we'll be able to showcase at UNGA that most, if not all, of the anchor partners and champions of the partnership have not only you know, met those commitments and achieved those commitments, but far surpassed those commitments. A second part of the partnership is very much around collaborations, supporting, deepening, broadening collaborations among subsets of partners to advance concrete work to really achieve sustainable development, uh, utilizing many types of data, from official statistics to open data, geospatial to citizen-generated, and so much more. I want to ask you to see that what one of, I'd like to announce one of the exciting new collaborations that we have been able to uh, organize and assemble through the global partnership with our colleagues at the World Bank, DFID, and the government of Korea. You have in front of you a call for proposals, and I have the honor and the pleasure to announce that the global partnership in uh, collaboration with these great institutions will be, is launching today, as of tonight, a multi-million dollar uh, call for proposals for collaborative data innovations for sustainable development. Well. The, this is the beginning of that area of work to ensure that we harness all the different possibilities of collaboration and innovation, ensure it's scaled across regions, across countries around the world, to achieve the full set of sustainable development goals as led by countries around the world. Much of the rest of our uh, day today will focus on the work that we are doing in collaboration with our country partners whether it be Colombia, Sierra Leone, the United States, Philippines, Egypt, all around the world, that have been incredible leaders and vanguards in advancing the data for SDGs effort. And the last thing I just want to say before I uh, introduce uh, someone who is very special to us uh, is to say that um, the partnership is committed, at least for the next 14 more years, through the 2030 Agenda to continue to roll up its sleeves, as I often say, and to continue to advance action. We will have many other announcements at the UN General Assembly in September, many of them celebrating, as we will today, the commitments and implementation of commitments by many of you, the collaborations, 
um, and other uh, core priorities that we'll be advancing. It truly is a global partnership that moves from uh, speaking to action very quickly, learns together, experiments, um, and continues to innovate and scale. And that would not be possible without each and every one of you. So let me take, you know, it's been a, a busy and intense year, so I would like to thank all of you for all of what you've been So without further ado, one of the key decisions we made back in November as a very young partnership was to uh, have a UN foundation host us. Um, it, went, it was a globally competitive process, and the me members of the panel that selected the UN Foundation just knew that it was the right place for us to be in our first years of growth and innovation and impact. Since we've been together at the uh, UN Foundation, the support, uh, the partnership, uh, the caring, frankly, that like the UN Foundation has put into nurturing the partnership, working with all of us in the interim secretariat, working with all the partners, has really been tremendous. And I want to welcome Kathy Calvin, who's the president of the UN Foundation, to say a few words and thank her. And well, I'm going to start by saying, let's give Sanjeev another round of applause. Oh. We host three other alliances, coalitions, partnerships, and so I watch, I watch them all very carefully. And I have to say what I've learned from watching you and this burgeoning partnership and the approach you've taken to collaboration, to learning, and to really helping others come along on that journey is very powerful. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for asking us to be your partner. And, and thank you for making sure that data isn't just something only a few people talk about, because it's the, I think it's the, the buzziest thing we got going on the <coughs> SDGs. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I came tonight because I want to hear the panel, so I'm not going to be long, because I, I'm really interested in what we do need to learn about data, its role in the SDGs, how it's going to be critical to our getting to the 2030 sustainably achieved goals. I just came out of a session with a number of uh, ministers who are in town for the HLPF, and I have to say, this issue is so core. We're not gonna get there if we don't have a good way to use data to make decisions, if we don't have a good way to use data to evaluate, and if we don't have a good way to use data to keep ourselves honest. So I happen to know how important this is, and we are making such good progress. And the panelists here today are really interesting because we're going to learn how, at the end of the day, the goals are going to be met is at the country level, so it's going to be great to hear what, what's going on there. So I think partnerships are the key to getting the goals achieved, and so the fact that 150 organizations have come together to say, let's do this together, let's make sure we're not duplicating each other's efforts is really important. And it's really important in this space because while the national statistical offices will always remain so central on this issue, it's also clear we need many other actors if we're going to infuse data into all of our work. So it's new data, new data sources, new technologies, new actors, they all make up the whole data revolution. That's the way we're gonna unlock the potential that the SDGs are putting forward. And so I see a real opportunity for us to see our way to 2030 in some new ways. So when the UN Foundation took this on, it was partly because we had our own experience in learning about the data revolution by looking at the question of gender. And we come to the realization with our partners, USAID, the Hewlett Foundation, and others, you can't have gender parity if you don't have gender data parity. And that drove us to create Data 2X, which is a, a part of this big initiative and, and partnership, and we've, we've been excited by the progress that's being made in recognizing how critical these two issues are together, that you can't get one without the other. But we've also been really proud to see the progress that's being made across the across all the sectors in, in data. And I just want to say congratulations again on the innovation announcement today with the World Bank. That's just another example of the kind of work that's already being done, and we're just getting started. So we look at all of this and say, 
We've got a long way to go. We look forward to some milestones along the way, 2020, 2018, and others. They are real, and we've got to take them seriously. But I think when we come together at the next, next HLPF, we're going to have a lot to report. So congratulations. Thank you all for letting us be a, a big part of it, and we look forward to supporting you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move straight to our panel, and can everyone hear me? Or should yes. I? Yes. Okay, I'll still use the microphone just because we might be taping. Um, so back in Addis, as I said, when we announced the partnership, it was very clear to us with our country partners, um, many of whom were there at the very beginning, and some new that we welcome uh, very much, Sierra Leone and Egypt, on this panel, um, more recent to the partnership that country-led efforts and supporting country-led efforts and learning from them and fostering uh, learning and sharing across country-led efforts was absolutely essential to any success the partnership could achieve. Over the last 10 months to a year, countries that are represented on this pa uh, panel, but all over the world, have been advancing their SDG efforts. But there are, really are you know, a dozen or 20 that have really taken data seriously and are moving really mountains in bringing together data to achieve and monitor the SDGs and, and sustainable development goals as they are internalized in their national plans. So we have, as you know from your, um, your uh, uh, run of show here, we have Simone Gabriel, the Minister of Planning of Colombia, Daniela Blue Ares, the Senior Advisor for Development at, uh, in the United States government, uh, Dr. Sam Cisse, the Special Advisor to the President of the Sierra Leone, uh, Lisa Grace Rosales, the Chief Statistician of the Philippines, and Dr. Yosser Maj, the Chief Statistician working on sustainable development statistics in uh, the Statistics Department Government of Egypt. I'm going to ask a few questions to them and so you can hear about some of the concrete progress that's being made, but also some of the challenges that we all have to work together, they're working together on, um, to further advance the agenda we set, set for ourselves. First question, and I'll sort of go down the line, is what are some of the early successes in advance, utilizing data, advancing the data road work, uh, the roadmap work in your countries? What has really been powerful demonstrations of how important this is to achieve the same Thank you, Sanjeev, and it's a pleasure to be here. I was, I was one of the people that was here a year ago when you launched the initiative, so I'm very happy to see that it's blossomed uh, even further. Um, so let me tell you about Colombia and our story. Uh, Colombia was one of the first countries that proposed SDGs, was the first country to implement. Currently, we have more or less we have action on 86% of the targets. Right? That means either we have, uh, they're part of the 2017 budget, there's legislation in place, there's regulation in place, on them, and of the 240 indicators, <laughs> or the 240 uh, indicators that are used to follow the advancements, we have statistics for more or less 130 of them. 72, we have partial information. And for 38, we have no information. And so let me tell you an example of how data affects policy. So. Of those 38, one of the things that we don't measure in Colombia, and we were not used to measuring things like that, was food waste. Right? It's something that we didn't measure. Right? We just didn't, we had never gone around to it. Right? We had a narrative in Colombia that since we're, we're a middle-income country and a poor country, right? food waste was not an issue. Right? So we began a study at DNP, the National Planning Department, for the first time, measuring food waste, right? It's something that came because of the SDGs, right? It's something we wouldn't have thought of doing before, sort of measuring food waste. So we came up with the, the first study of it, and it came out that Colombia wastes 34% of the food it produces, right? Uh, that number, for a country that has so many challenges regarding nutrition and challenges regarding child nutrition and certain areas of the country that require uh, such sustained efforts on, on, on uh, poverty reduction, 34% was, let me put it this way, traumatizing for the country. We just had no idea. That number, that single data point, sparked a great deal of movement. 
there's, there's a piece of legislation in the Colombian Congress, right? There was a big ample debate on the subject. The uh, uh, corporate uh, entities and, and companies started becoming more aware of it. And local governments started <laughs> creating food banks because of that single data point, right? And that happened because the SDGs, we had a statistical gap, we filled the gap, and we got policy results, private sector engagement, and civil society addressing the issue. So data points and information are key. And I, I mean, I would like to paint that as a, as a great example of how data can improve public policy and raise awareness on many issues. One of the main things we also have to work on is improving uh, periodicity, right? Sometimes we take measurements every five years, or every 10 years on single subjects. And we can't really track, we can't really track improvements. Because uh, one of the things that is very important about data is uh, making sure that since you have a 15 year period where you're measuring improvement and development of countries, right, you need to be able to be careful of how to separate what's inertia, right? What's inertia uh, regarding economic development? I mean, over the next 15 years, most countries are gonna grow, right? Since most countries are gonna grow, healthcare will probably improve, water will probably improve, so on and so forth. But we have to differentiate between inertia, achieving SDGs, and what is the active role, what is the actual role of government and civil society and private sector of the additional delta over the inertia of certain measurements from statistics, right? And I would say one of the biggest challenges or one of the biggest opportunities of data is, especially big data, is improving periodic, period, the, the periodic measurements, right? So you don't measure every five years, you're, hopefully you can measure in less than one year, six months, and maybe real time. And that will help you address issues early and get more successes into the public policy. Thank you so much. I may just say, before we pass over to Daniela, Simone uh, and Colombia has been such a tremendous partner, but you really enforce, reinforce one of the key core principles of both sides of the partnership. That is dynamic, disaggregated data to support decision making, empower citizens, and foster innovation. And the example of food waste is such a powerful problem. Daniela, the US government has been you know, such a core anchor partner since the very, very beginning, even before the beginning, in so many ways. I know that uh, with your leadership and Paul Zeitz and many others, all the way to the very top, lots of things are happening domestically and internationally. So maybe you could pick one on each side or whatever sounds good because there's so much going on. But yeah. welcome and please, we'd love to hear. Thanks so much, Anjeev, and, and a pleasure to be here with all of you and also to be on this panel with a set of leaders who are really at the forefront of driving implementation of SDGs at a national level. And in some ways, I feel like our chief statistician should be up here talk because she really has been such an incredible leader. And we did try to get her to come, but she couldn't make it. But she has been a, a really incredible leader um, in implementation within the US government. Because in many ways, when we've looked at uh, domestic implementation, I'll talk first a bit about that, the starting point has been getting a baseline of our data uh, and really using our existing um, national statistical system and the network of data and agencies that gets collected to uh, rapidly, and, and we're working you know, right now to get that data together so we can quickly be able to report on how we're doing domestically on these goals. And similar um, to Columbia, it sounds like, I think what we found is that for about half of the indicators, we already have uh, data from our existing reporting systems. For about a third, there's proxies and, and other types of data, and then there's some where we really don't have that data yet available. Uh, but I think that gives us a pretty exceptional starting point uh, to be able to put out there how we're doing, and that collection right is happening right now. Uh, and we plan to share that openly, put it on open platform, so it's something that domestic actors, um, international actors can all see and use and uh, start building kind of comparable data out there with all the countries on this stage and elsewhere. Uh, and a couple of just reflections on um, how that 
kind of process has and how the SDGs have created a bit of a, a really different set of actors coming together within our government. In many ways, the engagement on the goals did start as a um, centered around our diplomacy and engagement in the political process to gain agreement. But even at that time, you know, three years ago now, when the negotiations started on the goals, we tried to do things differently. And for every sector area, brought experts from across the US, US government, our domestic agencies, our foreign, USA State Department, international agencies, to identify what were the goals and targets that were really achievable. And so we, so, you know, whether it was on health or ocean health, we had people from our domestic agencies and CDC involved. On environmental issues, we had EPA. On oceans, we had NOAA. And we really brought a, a group that could look at the technical aspects of what was achievable from a target perspective, as well as a policy perspective in the process. And I think that's really created a bit of a different paradigm for the way now we're tackling implementation that is cross, cutting across technical actors and policy actors um, uh, on each of the issues. So, uh, you know, and, and that it's, I think, still a work in progress, but for instance, in setting up this data platform for our national data, we have the people who've been working on open data domestically, which has been a very big movement in the US government. We've released um, data.gov, it's kind of been our platform for releasing huge amounts of data that's really led, led to a lot of economic activity. For instance, weather data um, early on in the Obama administration has created a multi-billion dollar industry. So we've had those teams working with our chief statisticians teams, working with our policy folks, both at um, the State Department and USA, but also all the domestic agencies that uh, collect data. So I think there's a real opportunity in this to link together the robust technical um, expertise that exists in, in governments with a policy and political agenda. Uh, and I think um, one, if I take a specific issue, two specific issue areas briefly, uh, one I'll highlight is HIV AIDS because we have, we have the uh, International AIDS Conference happening right now in Durban. And I think there you've seen, for instance, on the international side, our PEPFAR program, who is now providing publicly uh, data down to the facility level about what's, what's happening on HIV, what communities are affected, um, where, where geographically those are, what services are being provided, and that allows our counterparts in other countries, one, to see what we're doing and supporting, but also has really shifted uh, the way we're working with our counterparts in, in, in the most affected countries to target, right? So the recognition that women and girls are the most affected, the recognition that certain communities are where HIV is spiking, uh, and others where we've actually succeeded. And, and it's really allowing a different conversation. And that that's also happening uh, domestically on HIV. That kind of uh, data is allowing us to really uh, target efforts and find the places in the communities that are most affected. And the second place I'll highlight where we have that domestic and international linkage happening is around Goal 16. Our Department of Justice has an Access to Justice initiative, uh, which is timely and, and challenging, but really is focusing on how we can improve our systems as well as um, work with other countries to tackle tough issues around ensuring equal access to justice and making sure it's reaching communities and understanding what the data is telling us about who's being reached uh, and not reached. So I, I very much think the opportunity is incredible for data to to basically create very different linkages within governments and then across all of our governments to pinpoint what really works, where action can happen, and create political will, like you discussed on food waste, to tackle issues that might have been um, otherwise hidden from policy leaders and, and the public domain. Thank you so much, Daniela. Dr. Cisse, Sierra Leone has come through some difficult times, as we know. Um, but there's been some quite remarkable work being done on SDG implementation and the use of data uh, in Sierra Leone. Perhaps you could share some of the, the highlights of some of that early work that is really moving the country forward through difficult through these past difficult years. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjeev. 
And thank you everybody for listening to me tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here to share our own experience at Sierra Leone and the process of uh, global partnership towards uh, data revolution. For us in Sierra Leone, we were in fact the first country in Africa that really had a national workshop, open, uh, well representative workshop to determine the type, kind of data, who will be the beneficiaries, how do we get it, how do we ensure it is available to end users in a situation that we have a very high rate of illiteracy. Uh, what kind of presentations do we make so that the ordinary person would understand? We had that workshop, and I think we were among the first few countries in the world that really undertook that exercise. We brought in everybody into the house. Now, coming from a background in which I was a director of policy, planning, money, and statistics, we used to give this task as a sacred one to the experts, my colleagues and ourselves here are seated. We are the people who discuss and agree on what needs to be done, how it will be done, who will receive it, and we end up being the end users. Now this time under the SDG arrangement, we have brought in everybody, the academia, the civil society, the private sector, government of course, all parties that are very important in the implementation of the SDGs were brought on board in order to determine uh, what kind of data set that we would need, how we would collect them, and how we would ensure that we report on progress. And uh, taking the principle of leave, leaving no one behind, we also sounded the opinion of those people who cannot, uh, who are more or less illiterate, to be able to determine what aspirations we would have as a country to promote our own country, and therefore the kind of data that we'll have to generate. Uh, over and above that, through the initiative of His Excellency the President, and this is where political uh, leadership and will is important, he has been able to establish a secretariat for the identification, streamlining, monitoring and reporting on international benchmarks, including the SDGs. Under his office, he is directly overseeing that exercise to make sure that we do something and progress is being reported on. And in fact, what we have further done is to align all the, the goals and indicators that we have selected as a country. We know very well that the goals and indicators that we have globally uh, we have to adopt them according to our, our own development aspirations, and we have done that as a, as a country. We've been able to identify 139 indicators, and already we have about 59 that we have uh, baselines. And we have tried to align these uh, in, uh, indicators with our own national development program. That is the agenda for prosperity. And we have eight pillars. So what we have ensured is that all the goals that we have selected and their indicators will make sure that we position them within the eight pillars of our national development program. And a minister is given the responsibility to lead each of the pillars and to ensure that the implementation is done and they are going to report to the president on the implementation. And there is also a contractual obligation. It is not just a responsibility because for us there in Sierra Leone, uh, ministers sign contract with the president. And some of these things like the SDGs, the indicators, they are part of that package of uh, contractual obligation. So if you don't do something about, the, about that, the president will do something about you. <laughs> I, I was a minister eight years as minister of agriculture before I, I was appointed a, a special advisor to him by the end of last year. So I know what it means when you sign a contract with the president and they are not performing. So I think that really is a very important uh, arrangement that the President has made. And I have been appointed as a national coordinator for international benchmarking, including the SDGs, directly under his office. Uh, we have so many other things that we have been able to achieve uh, under the, um, the, the 
uh, data revolution, but I think I need to uh, stop here so far so that I can give chance to my colleagues here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lisa. Lisa, will you join us? I mean, Philippines has been doing, has been such a leader um, in Asia and across the world, and certainly with respect to national statistical agencies reaching out across government, across sectors. Perhaps you could share some of the highlights that have happened over the last two years uh, under your leadership. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, the ambition of uh, Agenda 2030 has indeed spilled over the community that is tasked to provide information for policy and uh, program implementation, the statistical community. And in the Philippines, as early as 2014, the highest governing, the highest policy making body uh, for the Philippine statistical system has actually already uh, approved a resolution uh, in joining all agencies to harness digital revolution uh, to support the SDGs. And in 2015, uh, last year, our the same uh, high, high level policy making for the statistical system approved our updated national strategy for the development of statistics, which includes a chapter on SDGs, data for SDGs. And after the US Statistical Commission met this March in May, uh, the board also uh, had a resolution in joining all concerned agencies, multi-stakeholder bodies to support data for monitoring SDGs. So for us, very important is the high level political support as represented in the uh, governing board of the Philippine statistical system. With that, we then worked on existing strengths. I believe these are our existing strengths, which are good coordination among different stakeholders. So uh, we work with interagency committees. We have been doing this since the monitoring of the MDGs, where committees come together to discuss data, specifically data, to be able to monitor the MDGs, so now SDGs. And uh, with this, we were able to do already two workshops, where we mapped the different SDG indicators as suggested, by the expert group on, on SDG indicators, and we, are, we were able to look at availability of data, how frequent the data are being produced, what are the data gaps, possible sources that we can tap, which would include private sector or even uh, civil society data. And we were able to uh, map and see that we already have about 60% of those indicators with national data and some regional data, but a number of them have data gaps, especially down to the subnational level. So we are now looking at pilots for subnational level ecosystems. So uh, we have decided that we shall continue, of course, with the traditional sources of information. We shall continue the censuses. We shall continue the important surveys that we do, but we cannot do all of them every year, so we will have to augment them with other sources of information. Also, down to this national level, we shall use uh, administrative data registers, and we have already done a data a, a workshop on big data, talking to telecommunication companies on how they can support uh, uh, our uh, more timely uh, monitoring of some of the statistics. So. Uh, Partnerships and collaborations are really very important because the statistics office and the statistical system cannot do this alone. And we are really very happy that we have very good support uh, from various sectors within the country and globally. And of course, the global partnership. We are very happy that we have been part of this from the beginning because we have benefited a lot from learning from each other in in sessions such as this. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Dr. Um, um, I was lucky enough to go to the preparatory meeting, uh, Africa preparatory meeting for the HLP BOPAP 
voluntary reporters in Cairo. Um, and uh, the vice minister unfortunately couldn't be here. Uh, and he also presented on this remarkable data roadmap for SDG implementation, where Egypt took uh, the global goals, aligned them with Africa 2063 into their sustainable development strategy, and uh, really uh, marshaled a tremendous amount of data, including key performance indicators on inputs and outputs all the way down the line. And I was just blown away. And so we got to having a very good conversation and I want to welcome you, and I think you have an announcement to share with us about Egypt. Um, so welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Um, actually, we are preparing for the next steps. Uh, the first one, we are now preparing meetings with uh, the other uh, uh, partners of the ministries and uh, entities uh, in Egypt to make sure that we didn't miss anything from the previous, um, uh, we we have a previous uh, report. We uh, we made we made it. We give it to uh, uh, General Bakr, uh, the head of uh, Cadmus. And now we have to be sure that we didn't miss anything. Uh, so we are going to get uh, them in um, workshop meeting and workshop so we know uh, if we have any uh, available data so we can use it in uh, SDG indicators. Uh, the other thing, we, um, uh, Egypt is a member of the interlinked uh, group and we are going uh, to know, uh, to identify the core uh, indicators that uh, serve for our country that um, leaving us, okay, if we can uh, get all the indicators, hope we can, but anyway, if we can. So we have this core indicator that lead us, uh, which uh, represents more than tar one target or one goal. Uh, the other thing that we are a member of the governance uh, group, Paraya group, and uh, I mean, one of the um, Sustainable Development Unit member, uh, she went there and she attended uh, the meeting. We come up with that we have to have a seminar. So we are holding uh, a seminar 27 this month uh, to uh, advocate for the advocacy uh, about not only governance, but we, we are concentrated in this, but it's a good opportunity to um, uh, let uh, the partners and uh, people from different uh, ministries know uh, about uh, what we are doing and why. <coughs> and the other thing that we are preparing from now for the zero draft uh, statistical report, and uh, this one, the official one, and uh, I think it will be ready for next January. Uh, we will put everything we have, we put, uh, because we discussed about the base year, but we, we found that it's, it's not um, available for one year. I mean, the indicator, some of the indicator available in year uh, 2015, uh, some of 2014, and uh, some of this uh, not yet even started. So we put everything in this report. Uh, we call it the draft statistical report. And this is the first report we uh, official, officially put and we dist distribute in Um The last thing we are talking about in, uh, in Cadmus, we were talking about how to mapping. All um, um, indicators from SDGs, uh, SDS, and we are talking about also uh, the agenda, the African agenda, which is very important because we uh, we have we have a lot of uh, um, dimensions we should take care of it. 
you can see the SDS actually and uh, SDG and the African agenda, they are not uh, very much uh, uh, away from each other. They are related somehow. Um, the most important thing, the most important point now we are taking care of is to see, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, if I can get more data from the available sources without paying uh, more money because it costs. Uh, but some of the indicators, like uh, Vault 16, some of it asking about um, uh, the opinion of people, which means we have to do surveys. Um, that's very important in this stage. We don't want to spend money. Um, I'm sorry to say that, but <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to spend money in data. We can get it. It's maybe available, but not accessible yet. Uh, so we we are trying to make it accessible, uh, and by uh, meeting and workshop with the entities, we can do that. In Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to say we welcome Egypt as the newest country member of the Global Partnership, and we are so delighted to have you join us. Thank you. So, uh, we're a little bit behind schedule. I just want to ask the panelists if there is anything they'd like to share with the audience about you know, their hopes or visions or the challenge they want to raise. One lightning round of anything you'd really like to say. Well, I'd like to say something my colleague from, uh, from uh, the Philippines mentioned, which I think is key, right? which is SDGs were not, uh, and the, the way we measure SDGs are not meant to be a, a competition, right? So you have voluntary targets and voluntary goals, and so on and so forth. But I, I, I do think that with this conversation, we need to come up with a way to keep people honest. And, and data plays a big role in keeping people honest on this. And I want to go back and make a stronger point about this issue of inertia. If you have a country growing at four, five, six percent by doing nothing, right, you're going to make improvements in your social development targets and goals. And what, what we really want to measure when we when you're engaging in SDGs is what's the true effort? What's the plus? Right? What what's what's if, if if we didn't have them, right? We would still have the economies grow, but what's the true difference here, right? And you know the, the guiding principle be behind SDGs is this concept of leaving no one behind. And that is especially relevant, and I want to make the strong case that the principle of leaving no one behind uh, for that principle, data is key. Because as any statistician will tell you, averages tell lies. Okay? And, and here's my point. If you're, if you're doing public policy, and you're making an investment budget, usually a, a policy maker will try to have the most impact per investment. Right? So what usually will happen is that we measure impact per investment in number of people. And if we're going to do impact per investment by number of people, we tend to have a skewed investment schedule in favor of urban areas. So one of the most important things, and I think this is the challenge for data, is to the world, to the, to the world of equality, we need to introduce a concept of territorial equality, right? Especially rural areas are the areas where it's hard to get there because there's not a lot of people, right? So investment doesn't get there. And that concept of leaving no one behind, I'm gonna make the case that for middle income, even upper income countries, right? Averages lie, right? So the, the, the challenges that we have right now from a public policy, I think agenda worldwide, and I don't think Colombia is the exception, is that you might have strong national government statistical agencies right, that are able to disaggregate information to a territorial level, but we have very poor 
to work in, in most countries, or at least in my country, statistical agencies at the local level, which are local. And so, for example, even in upper income countries, let's say, I want to make, I hope no one gets offended in the United States. Uh, you know, if you pick a certain area of the United States, if you go to West Virginia, right, and you pick certain municipalities in West Virginia, you might find some average, some, some numbers where maybe we're leaving someone behind. If you take the national average, that's not going to show up at all. So statistics at the local level, statistics where you can take territorial equality as an ingredient for leaving no one behind, even in the wealthiest countries or middle income countries, is the key challenge in uh, data equality, I think, for, for the next couple of years in, in this in this end. Thank you so much. So I want to thank the panelists and say that there's lots more I know you all could share. There will be time in the in the session, you know, the drinks and, and reception afterwards. Um, but please, if you could join me in giving all of them a round of applause. But also, I hope you get a glimpse of the tremendous efforts that these countries and many like them, uh, but not as many as we would like to see, are doing to advance data for sustainable development. So we want to valorize these tremendous leaders and their countries and also promote this more broadly. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.